They won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's very true. And that's what Paul is saying here. Gifts, knowledge, abilities, all of that's nothing unless you have love. So that, that's the first thing he's doing here. He's setting out for the Corinthians the more excellent way. Let's consider secondly, that's love emphasized. Let's consider love elaborated. And here we want to look at these uh, positive verbs that I've mentioned from verse 4 on. There are about 15 terms in this section. Eight of them, as I said, in the negative. Seven positive regarding what Christian love is. We're just going to focus in for time's sake on the positive ones. Firstly, love suffers long. Well, love is patient, you may have in your version. Uh, it's a, a word, a composite word, and the first part refers to something which is large or expansive, and the second part uh, refers to wrath or indignation or rage. And so if you put the two words together, that's what you've got. It means long to wrath or long to anger, long to rage, long tempered. I mean, I don't know if you use the phrase here in, in uh, the U.S. We talk about someone with a long fuse, someone with a long fuse, uh, yeah, there, there's a cartoon that uh, my kids used to watch. It was Roadrunner, and uh, he would have this uh, b ball of dynamite, and it would have a fuse. And sometimes the fuse went for miles, and it would be lit, and then it would be a long time until that bomb actually went off. And that's what the word means. It means long-tempered. It means having a long fuse. It's a long time before that person blows up, as it were, with anger. It takes a lot to really make them angry. That's what the word means. And so you can see then it refers to someone who is patient, long-suffering, slow to anger. And in the society of the day, something like that, of course, what was uh, really, it would have been seen as a weakness and a flaw in Greek society. Um, Aristotle, apparently, he said, Greek virtue is the refusal to tolerate any insult or injury and a readiness to strike back at any hurt. So that was the way they thought that you ought to be. If someone wrongs you, someone hits you, then you hit back straight away and you hit back twice as hard. That was the way they operated. It was a sign of strength, they believed, in those days. But Paul, he says, no, Christian love recoils from anything like that and instead it manifests itself in patience and a long fuse, a real slowness to anger. As we see in God himself, uh, when the Lord appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai, and passed before him, he proclaimed his name there. And you remember how he described himself? This is Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Psalm 86, the same thing, verse 15. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. That's who you are says the psalmist. That's the kind of God you are. You're a God who's slow, slow to anger. God who's so patient with sin as a God with a long fuse, we might say. Because it's a long time, isn't it? Very often before his wrath actually breaks out. Um, if you think about the antagonism, think about the provocation that he experienced from his own people, the Israelites, their, their whole history, really. It's just one long list of rebellions and defiance and provocation. Uh, Nehemiah again, he says this, Nehemiah chapter 9 says, They refused to obey. They were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but instead they hardened their necks. And in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. And so that's what they did. They did all of these things to resist you, to defy you, uh, to provoke you. And yet you, he says, are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. So you're patient, he says. You're so long-suffering. Even though you had every reason just to wipe them off the face of the earth, you, you didn't. You held back. You were slow to anger. You are patient. You suffered long. You, you've got, he says, you've got a really, really long fuse. There, there was a, a Chicago lawyer in the last century. His name was Robert Ingersoll. And uh, he was an ardent atheist, very avowed atheist and very outspoken. He would lecture on the subject as well. And one time he was lecturing his students, and during the course of the lecture, he took out his pocket watch, and he said, I give God five minutes, five minutes to strike me dead for what I've just said. Well, that was then reported to a Christian man called Theodore Parker, and he smiled and said, did Mr. Ingersoll really think he could exhaust the patience of the eternal God in five minutes? Because that's who he is. 
He's the infinite, eternal God, slow to anger, patient, long-suffering, long-fused, we could say, with those who provoke him. How about you? Are you like that in the church? Do you have a spirit like that in the church? We ought to have, Paul says in Ephesians 4, strive to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Now, how do we do that? Well, he goes on to tell us there, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. So that's it, and that's what we need to do. This is the way that we need to be with each other in the life of the church. We need to be long-suffering. We need to have a long fuse with each other. Sometimes in the church, we, we don't always get on as well with each other as we should. Sometimes we can annoy each other we can rub each other up the wrong i mean so don't get me wrong sometimes the church can be a taste of heaven can't it but but not always uh you know that rhyme don't you um to dwell above with saints we love oh won't that be glory but to dwell below with saints we know oh that, that's a different story sometimes there can be irritation and annoyance and conflict down here below and there are people who, who irritate us and rub us up the wrong way just as they, i mean this is going on in corinth this is how it was there they had problems there. there's tension strife uh, friction beginning to develop amongst them and so what to do there strike back lash out hit back twice as hard as the greeks would do no no paul says don't do what they out there do follow your heavenly father be like him be slow to anger be patient and that fuse that you have before your bomb goes off make sure it's a really really long fuse that's the first thing love is long suffering secondly love is kind again this is verse four this is really the flip side of long suffering well long suffering is the ability to endure and withstand and absorb hurts and offenses and wrongs kindness by the same token is the willingness and the ability to pay them back not with evil but with good long suffering says i I can take whatever arrows they fire at me. Kindness afterwards says, and I'll seek to do whatever good I can to them in return. That, that's what kindness does. That's really the essence of the word there. It's a word that can come, uh, or it does come from a root word that means useful. It means to be useful, helpful, kind. They may not have been very kind to you. They may have been very unkind to you. But where there is this aspect of agape love in a person's life, then he or she seeks to repay that person with kindness and again when we put it in those terms you can see this is reflective of the character of god himself think about the provocation he receives think about the antagonism he receives from his own people how defiant they can be how defiant we can be and yet how does he respond with patience long suffering and continually with kindness um we could go to nehemiah 9 again and there he recounts the rebellion the obstinance the stiff neckedness of the people and yet, how did God respond? He was gracious, patient, long-suffering, and on top of that, he was so kind. He gave them a pillar of cloud by day, Nehemiah says, and a pillar of fire by night. You gave them your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, their feet did not swell. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven. So, you see what he's saying? He's saying, you're so kind. You're just so very, very kind to your people. That's how you show yourself continually, unfailingly towards them. And so, as God's people then, today, how ought we to be? How are we to conduct ourselves? Well, shouldn't we be kind to each other? You know, for an example, think about the book of Ruth. That's a, yeah, that's a great book as an example of kindness, isn't it? Uh, you think about Ruth there in that book and her kindness to Naomi, leaving her own home to go and accompany her and to be a companion to her and then going out into the fields to find grain to give sustenance for her. And then, you know, Ruth's out there, isn't she? She's out in the fields one day and then she bumps into this man called Boaz. And Boaz, you think about him. Um, what word would you use? One word came into your mind to describe Boaz. What would you say? Well, that man is, he's so kind, isn't he? Out there in the field, giving her the right to glean sheaves and then water to drink. And he 
fights are over. Place at the dinner table, extra bundles of grain, ephra of barley to go home with as well on top of that. Kindness after kindness after kindness. That's one of the big themes in the book of Ruth, isn't it? Hesed, the, the Hebrew word, loving kindness that they experience because they are in covenant with the God of Hesed, the God of loving kindness. How do you know they're in covenant with him? It's by the loving kindness that they show to each other. That's what shines out from the book of Ruth against the dark backdrop of the judges' period. And so Paul here in 1 Corinthians 13 to the Corinthians, this is the same kind of thing. It's the dark backdrop of one, uh, f- sorry, first, first century Corinthian society. He's saying, let it be your kindness against that dark background. Let it be your kindness shining forth. Now, what about us today in our society? Against the dark, deteriorating backdrop of our modern society, is your kindness shining forth? Are you seeking to grow and excel in the grace of Christian kindness? Paul says here we should. He's saying here this, this is the more excellent way. Long-suffering. Uh, be kind. Third positive statement in these verses. Love rejoices in the truth. Now, this is in contrast to what's gone immediately before. Verse 6 says, love does not rejoice in iniquity. That is an attitude which rejoices, takes delight in the downfall, the stumbles, the slip-ups, the difficulties of others. It delights in, in seeing others fall down in some way. I remember my uh, parents telling me a story one time that uh, their pastor from their church had told during one of his sermons, and they relayed it to me, and uh, the pastor had two young sons. Uh, One was called Murray, he was two years old, and his other son was Wesley, he was three years old. And uh, one morning, Murray had come running out of his room, little lad, and he ran past the stairs and lost his balance at the top and tumbled down the stairs. And uh, there were floods of tears, but it was a carpeted staircase, He, he was fine. And then Wesley came running out of his room, and he was in tears. And they said, Wesley, why are you crying? And he said, because Murray fell down the stairs. And they thought, isn't that sweet? His brother's fallen down and he's crying. And they said, but it's okay, Murray's fine. Why are you still crying? Well, Murray fell down the stairs and I wanted to be there to see it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that's a three-year-old boy. um, But in the spiritual realm, that's the sort of thing we're talking about here. It's that kind of thing because of the sinfulness of our hearts there can be this desire to see someone else stumble and fall even a delight to hear about it when someone comes along and and, uh, have you heard about so and so have you heard what they did and the ears start to tingle at the tittle tattle that's about to come out Paul says no 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 love doesn't do that love doesn't delight in that kind of thing the sins the stumbles the moral falls of others. No, true Christian love doesn't delight in that. Rather, love delights in the truth and in the work of the truth and the evidence of the truth at work in another person's life, which means, practically speaking, that we aren't always looking for the areas where they don't measure up. We aren't always looking for those areas where they come short or where they fall down. Rather, instead, we want to focus on the truth and the work of the truth in that person's life. That's where love goes. Love gravitates towards that. Uh, You think about the Apostle John. He's sometimes referred to, isn't he, as the Apostle of Love. And in his third letter, verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. That, that's what love does. doesn't delight in downfalls, but rejoices rather in the truth. That's the third thing. Fourthly, love bears all things. And the word bears there is a word which means to cover. It actually comes from the word for roof, uh, the covering or shield that you put over a house to protect it, to shield it from the elements. And so that's what's being referred to here. That's what love does. It covers, it guards, it protects. doesn't want to expose or exploit weakness. Love instead wants to cover and protect weakness. Uh, You think about Noah's sons in this regard, with regard to their father. That's what they did, quite literally. They threw a covering over their father's weakness. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that we never expose sin. Of course, there are times when that has to be done for the good of the individual and for the good of the body as a whole. Sin, if it's serious, sin has to be revealed and dealt with. Um, there are times when something like that is necessary but even then it's something done with great heaviness and great sorrow of heart because the prevailing disposition of love is to to protect and to guard 
Fifthly, love believes all things, which doesn't mean that love is gullible or that it's naive. It doesn't mean that you have to act as if you were born yesterday or that you believe whatever it is anyone tells you, no matter what the evidence may be to the contrary. One writer I read on this subject gives the example of a husband uh, coming home from work, and his hair's disheveled, he's got lipstick on his car, he's got a smell of perfume about him, and uh, his wife says, why are you late? And he says, oh, I was just working uh, late, dear. And she says, well, yes, honey, of course, I believe whatever you tell me. <laughs> it's not that. It's not being gullible. It's not being blindly naive. It's, the word means having confidence in someone. It's having confidence of faith in a person's character. And so highly esteeming their character, that your natural inclination is to believe them. It is to think the best of them, to trust them. It's similar to the next thing Paul says. Love not only believes all things, but love hopes all things. Meaning that love isn't negatively pessimistic. Uh, always thinking that that person is going to fail. Or if they have fallen in some way, well, this is the way it's going to be now. The writing's on the wall for them. The die is cast, this is going to be their future, just one fall after another. No, no, love doesn't think that way. Love hopes all things. Love has an optimism, a godly optimism. Love hopes for better things to come. Love believes that if God has begun a good work in them, he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So this is what love does. It believes all things, it hopes all things. Finally, under this heading, also it endures all things. Now, that's a word that can be translated as hangs back or remains with. That's, that sounds strange, doesn't it? But this is what it means. Love waits for people. It doesn't desert people. In the original, uh, the word had a military connotation. It, it was a word that would be used of soldiers in a platoon. And they're coming under en enemy fire. One of them goes down and they say, no, we're not leaving him. We're not going without him. You sometimes hear this, don't you? Stories of uh, military regiments out on the battlefield and they take fire. One of them goes down and, and such is the, uh, the camaraderie, the esprit de corps among these men. They say, no, we're not leaving him. That's the way they respond, isn't it? And Paul says here that Christian love is very much like that. Agape, agape love among Christians is just like that. A friend loves at all times, Proverbs 17, verse 17, and a brother is born for adversity. True Christian love doesn't abandon people it doesn't forsake people it doesn't run from the scene as soon as there's trouble rather it stands beside them it's instinctive desire is to guard and to protect and to cover them that's the nature of real christian love just to summarize a long suffering covering hoping protecting never forsaking kind of love so let me ask you do you do you have this do you have this kind of love uh, do you manifest this in, in your own life? You've experienced this kind of love if you're a Christian. You have, because the only way that you can show this love is if you've received it yourself. And you have done if you're a believer, isn't it? The very reason you are a Christian this morning is because Jesus Christ has shown to you this very same kind of love. This is actually his love that's being described here. Uh, that brings us to a final point this morning. We looked at love emphasized, love elaborated. Finally, consider love exemplified in and through the person of Christ. That's really how Paul began this letter, when he had to tackle some of the tensions and strife, fightings at the beginning of the letter. What was his immediate answer to that? It was Christ. He went to Christ and to the cross of Jesus Christ. And he says there, you've got all these factions and fightings, you're striving, bickering with each other, he says in chapter 1, but you're forgetting the cross. How can you be proud if you think of the cross? How can you be angry with, with each other? Think about Jesus Christ and his cross. That's how he began the letter. And now in chapter 13, we have a similar sort of thing here. Pride, tension, conflict in the church. This time it's over gifts and talents and positions in the church. And so what does Paul do here? How does he answer this? He speaks about love. Love emphasized, love elaborated, and here love exemplified. In the person of Jesus Christ. One or two of the commentators point this out. What do you have in this list that we've just been through? This is not so much a list of do's and don'ts here. This is a person being described here. That's what we have here. A person whose life is completely dominated and controlled by the Spirit of God. A person who is so led by the Spirit of God that he thinks and acts and behaves in this way. And so ultimately in its most perfect form, this is Jesus Christ that we're being pointed to here. 
He's the perfect personification of all of these things. He's the one who's perfectly patient. He's the one who's supremely, perfectly kind. He's the one who covers, he completely covers all of our sins at the cross to pay for those sins. He died at the cross so that God now might keep no record of our sins. And he's the one who endures, doesn't he? He endures all our failings, all our flaws, all our faults, all our backslidings. He endures those and still he remains right by our side. Still he says, I'm not going. I won't leave you. I won't abandon you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is the perfect personification for all of all of these things. And for us as believers then, what wonderful comfort to know that we are held in the grip of this love. Human love, well, you know, don't you? Human love will fail you. Human love, it will disappoint you. But the love of Christ, it never will. It never will. Uh, do you know the story of George Matheson? He was a preacher in Glasgow in the 1800s. And as a young man, he suffered some serious eye problems. But by the time he was in his teens, uh, he was starting to lose his sight. But he'd already developed a, an attachment to a young lady by that time. Uh, he was deeply uh, in love with her. But when, he di- when she discovered that he was losing his sight, she broke off the relationship because she said she couldn't be married to a blind man. And he was absolutely heartbroken by that because he had such strong feelings for her. But at the same time, he was still able to praise God and trust God. Why? Well, because he knew something of this love. The divine love of Jesus Christ, this kind, patient, persevering, never forsaking love. He expressed it in a hymn. I'm sure you know it. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul on thee. I give thee back the life I owe that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Human love failed him. Human love let him down. But divine love held him in a grip that would not let him go. It's the kind of love then that we as believers have received from Christ. And so now, Paul is telling us here, this is the kind of faithful, persevering, long-suffering love that we should show to our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So yes, gifts have their place. They're important. But Paul says here, I show you a more excellent way. Let's pray. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul on thee, and give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have poured out upon us in Jesus Christ. Though we are most unworthy and undeserving, we thank you that your love pursued us and brought us to yourself and that you have worked by your grace the new birth in our hearts, that you've changed us and made us to be new, that you've put something of your own divine love into our hearts. Thank you that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to help us. We see so many areas where we fall down, where we fall short. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have these graces in abundance, that they would grow and flourish in our lives, that we may truly love each other, and that the outside world, the perishing world around us, would see and be able to say, see how these Christians love one another. Lord, we need help. And so we ask that you would enable us to live out these truths by the enabling of your Spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Okay, we have time to discuss uh, any questions that you might have. Can I bring the chair? Um, uh, No, let's get one here, shall I? Okay, sure. Any uh, questions? One thank God for the word clearly taught uh, concerning the most excellent way. Any questions that uh, you might have or comments? Comments are also welcome. There's a mic there, so if you raise your hand, the, the, the media team will come to you. Okay, uh, Pastor Kenneth there.
How do you deal with the sheep when it bites you? Um, so, <coughs> Pastor, you, you weren't very clear. Uh, could you just... Uh, could you just uh, <coughs> I, I, I repeat everything. Sorry, I, I missed the yeah. first part. What I was saying is that uh, normally what the shepherds would do is that when the cow is really not getting uh, the discipline and they are giving it, they would think it is misleading. It will mislead other sheep. They will either sell it or they will kill it. Now, back to the issue of loving. How do you deal with the biting sheep as a leader? So the oh, example has to do with the animals, like what a shepherd would do. So now, how do you do that with the Christians who oh, okay. give you that? Right. Um, so you're talking about uh, Christians in the congregation who might respond negatively to you as a pastor? Yeah, um, yeah that's, a, that's a common problem, I think, uh, one that we have to deal with uh, from time to time. Um, I, I, I guess you, uh, the approach is to recognize that the Lord has called you to, to be a shepherd of the sheep, and so you uh, seek to have a, a shepherd's heart for the flock, and you recognize that they're all different, and uh, some have different... Uh, more negative traits, some aspects of the sin nature come out more readily than others. So you go into the work with that kind of mindset and then in your day-to-day -day interaction with them, you uh, seek to always maintain the things that we've mentioned about, patience, the, uh, the, the long fuse. Um, I think being uh, prayerful is uh, very helpful in uh, interacting with people who are of that disposition. Um, just remembering from seminary, one of the things that uh, we learned in pastoral theology was uh, to, uh, if you have those uh, times of conflict or you've somebody in the congregation who is particularly critical of you and uh, they make that known, is uh, just to continue to pray for them. Uh, helps to uh, dissipate some of the, maybe the, the resentment and the bitterness that can rise up in your heart. Uh, we were told, you know, well, I think it was Dr. Beakey, I mentioned him earlier, he would say in uh, seminary classes, it's, it's hard to hate somebody that you've prayed for. So you just keep bringing that person's name to the throne and asking for God's grace in their life and in your life and to, uh, to guide you in interactions with them. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, Rob. That, yeah, that's a good book, yeah. Um, Pastor Rob was just mentioning a book by uh, Dr. Beakey called Handling Our Critics. And uh, so he's, uh, he's, a, he's a wise and experienced man, and he's had experience of this in, over the years. And so he's uh, put together a book which deals with all aspects of how to handle criticism from those in the congregation, the kind of um, weight that you need to um, allocate to criticism that you may receive. Uh, just for example, if a person is continually uh, critical or antagonist, antagonistic towards you, then when they bring another criticism, you, you know that's uh, just another in a long stream. And so perhaps you don't give that as much weight as the person who is, maybe people in the congregation who are generally very supportive of you, and then they come and bring a criticism, then you give that much more weight because you know that generally they're much more... Uh, Supportive. So that's a very good book for those who are pastors and uh, maybe you have people in the congregation who are uh, negative in that way. It's a, it's a good resource to get hold of. And uh, yeah, he gives a, a lot of different um, ways that you can handle those kind of situations. But an interesting thing I remember he said was that uh, you, you have to expect it. It really comes with the territory. If you're going to... Uh, if you're going to be a leader in a church, then you have to expect and not everybody's going to like you just by virtue of the fact that you're there at the front so often. Not everybody's going to appreciate you. He said in the Dutch church they have a saying, um, he who stands at the front 
must expect to get kicked in the rear. Um, so maybe you have to go into it with that sort of mindset. Mm. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question from uh, the passage we are learning. Uh, first Corinthians chapter 13, verse 18, 9 and 10. Now I need more clarification uh, on this thing and uh, it is love never ends for as for prophets who pass away, as for times we will cease, as for knowledge it will pass away. 9 says, for we know in part and we Professing a part, but when the perfect comes, the pastor will pass away. Now, my question is when all these things will pass or cease, uh, they have ceased already or they will cease when the class will return? That is my question. I want to more clarification on that. Um, yeah, that's, uh, there, are, there are different views on, on uh, the glasses. There are different views on uh, that passage. Um, from uh, my studies of that, um, verse 9, is that the one you quoted? For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Was that the passage? Before that. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, um, yeah, in terms of these verses, the, the perfect is Paul talking there about the, the, the Bible, the scriptures, when the completed canon comes, there are those who have the, that view that the, the gift of prophecy and knowledge and discernment and all of these kind of things are temporary gifts given until the perfect comes, which some have the view that that refers to the scriptures, that when we have the completed canon, then there will be no more need for uh, prophecy and knowledge and tongues and so on and so forth. So there, there are many good men who hold that view, and th there is another perspective also that the perfect refers to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes at the end of time, then uh, all of these things, there will no longer be any need for these things because uh, faith will become sight, and there'll no longer be any need for, for knowledge. We'll have understanding, um, all of those things. I think if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. Um, so that you come short in no gift, uh, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, I think, the, the emphasis in this chapter is that these gifts are, are temporary. They're given for a time, but then the second half of the chapter, he deals with those things which are abiding, those things which are permanent, and those things which will come when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And so at that time, um, we will see things perfectly. Uh, at the moment, we don't see them perfectly uh, we see in a glass darkly, it's very dim, but when we see him, we, sh we shall be like him, we shall see him as, it, as he is. So my understanding is that's referring to the coming of Jesus Christ. But I mean, there are men on different sides who have different views on that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Oh, it works. <laughs> I was thinking about what you said about courage to wear like employers in New York or in Osaka wouldn't consider that. Why is courage important? Um, I think I'm saying courage. Uh, character? Yes. Maybe it's my accent. Yeah. 
character is what I'm saying. Like, you know, the character marked by love is more important than, um, than well, in the, in the big city context than you know, having the abilities, the gifts, and uh, th that kind of thing. Oh, you're, now you're asking why? Because this is, what, this is the emphasis of Paul's chapter, that you know, love is the preeminent thing. You, you can have all the gifts, but if there isn't this Christian love being shown in our hearts, then all, all the gifts you may have are, are not uh, of no value. So um, it, it's love, it's the character of God himself. Um, the other things, uh, I mean, you, you can relate it to that question later at the end of the chapter, now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Um, you know, the, the things that we've mentioned, the gifts, there is a sort of a, there can be a selfish a aspect to this, there's pride involved in those. Um, the elements of faith and hope, those are both sort of more individual aspects. You have personal faith, hope is something quite individ individualistic, but love is, it goes outward, doesn't it? Love is always going out, it takes you out of yourself to, an, to another person. And that's something we see in the Godhead itself, um, within the, the Trinity. They dwell in a relationship of love, love to each other. And it's out of that love, or God's love for us, that we've been brought into that Trinitarian relationship. And then we're going to, when Jesus Christ returns, we'll be ultimately brought to be with Christ in that eternal relationship of love. Heaven is a place of love, you know, the, uh, the Puritans used to use that phrase. And so as we love, then we are reflecting the characteristics and attributes of God himself, God who is love and uh, who is continually pouring out his love upon us and dwells in that relationship of love. I think that's how I'd answer that. Based on uh, this question that has just been asked, I think in this context where most men are men who stand in the pulpit, men who are leaders, when you ask why is character important, I think another response would be that's where God puts the emphasis. Because if you look at the qualifications for elders and pastors, I think between Titus and First Timothy, is it 22, 23 qualifications? Look at all of them. Only one is vocation, that he must be able to teach. And everything else has to do with his character. And so I come back to what Pastor Mark said, uh, the, the quote from, uh, is it uh, Dr. Bicky? They won't care what you know until they know. Uh, exactly. So thank you. Any other question or comment? Any other question or comment? Oh. Since we are dealing with uh, leaders here in churches, can we put uh, somebody on discipline who doesn't show you love, but doesn't fight so, but they just don't love you as it were? Can they be disciplined for that? Um, I think it would depend on how the, the lack of love was being manifest, but uh, I think there would be kind of preliminary steps before that. You'd maybe come alongside them and in uh, pastoral visitation or even just uh, talking with them informally, just pointing out that you've noticed aspects of the way that they uh, talk to other members of the congregation that can be perceived as lacking in love. Um, so we've had that from time to time in the life of the church. People come in and uh, they come... The church we're at, we, uh, we have quite a lot of different people from um, different backgrounds and cultures and the East Coast itself can, you know, has its own sort of mentality and so we do get times when people just, just kind of rub each other up the wrong way and some can have a disposition towards that. So, uh, I mean, we never had to put anybody under discipline as such, but uh, there are times when you just have to take them aside and, and encourage them to be... Um, more gracious, more gentle, more loving in their approach and dealing with folks. But uh, I, I've never been in a situation where anyone's been disciplined for it. Um, I don't know if uh, Rob's had any uh, insights on that. Well, if we did have to discipline them for that, that would be a loving action. 
Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. right, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But no, we have not done that. Yeah. Any other comment? Oh, uh, let's say. Um, there are some reformed brethren who believe in uh, secondary separation. We are called to separate from the world. But if a brother, um, you have a difference in terms of doctrine or the application of doctrine, um, without being bitter, is there a room that you separate from such, such brethren? You don't harbor any bitterness, but you can't just agree in the application of, uh, of doctrine. Is there a room for secondary separation if it is done in humility? Maybe, uh, Pastor Mark, for the sake of others here, maybe what's secondary separation before we answer that? <laughs> secondary separation, as I understand, is uh, separating not only yourself from the person you see as in error, but also from the people who associate with those in error. Is that how you understand it? Yeah. Um, there's something we're going to come on to in a later session, I understand. Um, but there's, a, there's um, different tiers of um, priority that uh, you implement with regard to, to being able to work and uh, in particular working with people from uh, a different theological perspectives. Um, you have the kind of the tier one issues, which are the very fundamentals of the faith, um, the authority of scripture and the doctrine of Christ and substitutionary atonement, justification by faith, those are the tier one levels. Um, and so as long as you're agreed on those kind of things, there are areas where you can, you can work with people. Um, you know, in our church, we have uh, we've had fraternals with men who may have different views on uh, baptism and church government, but we're all absolutely agreed on the fundamentals, the tier one things, and so, you know, we fellowship together and pray together and in some ways work together. Uh, but if you don't have those, if you're not agreed on the fundamentals, then you, you can't work with people. There's, there's got to be unity in the truth. Um, then, you know, the secondary issues, the ones I mentioned, uh, baptism and uh, different opinions on church government, and the kind of third level issues, worship styles and things like that. Um, those are different levels of uh, uh, difference and there are areas that you can fellowship with people in, in that regard. Um, so your question was, with regard to love? Yes, it's uh, uh, love is but maybe you do not um, agree yeah. in the way. Let me give a practical example. If a brother feels he doesn't believe in the use of excessive instruments in worship in a church, uh, mm -hmm. Is he at liberty to leave that church and go to another church where such practices? They may be agreed doctrinally, even on the fundamentals, but maybe when it comes to the application of the Reformed doctrine, uh, we have embraced the doctrine, but how do we apply it in worship? How do we apply it in daily life? And especially when it, is, uh, it has to do with... Uh, um, uh, church life, we worship, things like that. Um, you can't agree uh, the way things are done in a particular church. Uh, is there room for a brother to separate himself without feeling any bitterness at all for the sake of their consciences? 
Um, yeah, I think in the, the life of the church, we have to have that so strong, robust uh, spirit of Christian love, uh, loving one another with a pure heart, uh, fervent, with fervent love, you know, strong, robust, uh, I think that word means elastic. And so we, we have to apply that in our interactions with each other. We don't get easily offended by each other. We try to cover that with, uh, you know, strong, uh, enduring Christian love. And that applies to maybe the differences that we have over certain things. We have to be able to, uh, to withstand that in the life of the fellowship. Um, people who have differences uh, on worship, would you say, were you saying? Yeah. Um, in the context that I'm from, we don't really have, I mean, we don't have music or anything like that, and so we're just uh, singing regular hymns. Um, people who would be more inclined towards the, the uh, contemporary music worship don't really come to our church anyway. They realize that, that that's not, they're not going to find that there. Um, if people were wanting to leave the church in order to go and find that, uh, I think we would try to reason with them and, and explain you know, what, what we believe about the regulative principle and the importance of maintaining worship like this. And you know, in a, uh, uh, a, uh, a fairly robust, loving spirit towards them. But if, uh, if they wanted to leave, um, we wouldn't put them under discipline for that. If they wanted to go to another church, then you know, we'd reason with them as much as we could. And, but if they felt they wanted to go somewhere else, then... In the end, we would allow them to do that. I don't know if uh, you have a different perspective, Rob. The only thing I'm thinking, um, Mark, is that we both have a friend who's a Presbyterian Reformed Church. Psalms only, no mm. instruments, my lives. Right, yeah. yeah. Pastor Mark and I have a mutual friend, Pastor Michael Ives. He's at the Presbyterian Reformed Church, a very uh, small denomination among the Presbyterians, but it's uh, psalms only, no musical accompaniment, and, um, and, and I preach in his church a couple times a year. He preaches in my church a couple times a year, and a fantastic brother, godly brother. And among ourselves, we both hold to regulative worship. Ours will be very similar to Mark's, but, but the application of it is different. So when I go there, I'm actually, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy their worship. I understand they're trying to be regular, uh, regulated in their worship. I, I differ in psalms only, uh, singing them, but um, we get along just fine. Now, when he comes to our church, uh, out of what we call a spirit of accommodation, we'll sing hymns which are out of the psalms, hmm. specifically, just from Michael Ives, hmm. Pastor Ives. Just because we know that for him, uh, that would be a stumbling block if it was a non uh, song, hymn, and for Dr. Beaky, we've done the same. Other uh, song singers, we would just because we know they're with us. Our, our uh, Blue Trinity hymnal has plenty of psalms, and uh, we will actually pick those hymns just to accommodate our brethren out of love. Mm, mm. Which I say agape, and you say what? Agape. Agape. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a thought from two Reformed churches um, going from you know, let's say an ultra-conservative view of the regulative worship to a pretty standard view of the regulative worship, as opposed to, again, going to the other extreme of, let's say, a band and all that kind of stuff. That, that's a different scenario altogether. Not that we would break fellowship necessarily with those people, but th there would be differences. Um, but I think for my own self, if someone is convinced that they're holding to a regulative perspective of worship, then we're going to understand that there's going to be some differences. We might use the blue hymnal, you might use the red hymnal. Mm. But I know that church, and they're seeking to uh, follow God and his worship according to scripture to the best that they can. Thank you. Any, we have a few minutes. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Yeah, thank you so much. You are free to. Okay, we thank God for the time that we have had, and uh, we thank God for uh, the explanation of that passage in First Corinthians. Uh, we will dismiss uh, just about eight minutes early, and that's that's to our advantage. I just have one one announcement to make from the 
from the food court there, and they are saying, um, they're saying, please pay attention to the meal cards or coupons that you are submitting. The staff at the food courts can only accept the meal card for that particular meal. So let's see if I can. So when you look at your, your meal cards that way, uh, they, um, they're accepting them from right to left, actually. So your first meal card there is the tea break, your second one is the lunch for Tuesday here, and then your third is the second uh, tea break. So don't give them this, I think, some are, I don't know whether these things are computerized or whatever they are, so give them in that order. So for tomorrow, this was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so for tomorrow you start from here. So they, they're saying, please do that, otherwise you might go there and say you already had your lunch before lunch and uh, it's going to be an issue. So let's take note of that. Okay, we'll close in a word of prayer, and uh, you will be dismissed for lunch. Uh, let's gather back at 14.30. Please, let's keep time. I realize there's no bell, so let's keep time. Uh, 14.30, we start so that the speaker has enough time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We did ask you when we began this session that you guide us and lead us, that you enable the speaker to be used of you, and we now come back to say thank you. And as we take a break, we pray, oh God, your blessings upon the food that has been prepared for us. May you bless it to the nourishment of our bodies and strength. And may you give us uh, a good time of rest and fellowship and bring us back at 14.30 for the next session. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed. Thank you. In terms of our vision, the vision of the School of Divinity is to be a center of excellence for Reformed Biblical scholarship, devotion, and teaching, impacting Africa with the gospel of Christ and a God-centered worldview. And really that, that encapsulates and undergirds everything that we're about. We want to be very clear about both academic excellence and evangelistic fervor. We want to be clear about, the, about uniting the, the head, the hands, and the heart. That's the vision of ACU as a whole, and it is most assuredly the vision of the School of Divinity. Um, the, the other thing that's important is that we view what we do in the School of Divinity as part of ACU. That's why we chose to be School of Divinity as opposed to a seminary. And everybody keeps using the term seminary, seminary, seminary. And that when we started, that's what we talked about. But a seminary is a standalone institution. A School of Divinity is part of the broader university. So we're not separate from ACU. We're not other than ACU. Um, we are an arm of ACU. We are, intricately, we are intricately involved and ingrained in the ethos of ACU. And that's important from two perspectives. Number one, it's important because when you talk about universities going adrift, there are a couple of things that happen that lead to that. One is you separate the university from the church. When you look at the great universities and the, the Harvards of the world and Princetons of the world, the first step in their theological and moral decline is that you divorce their work from the church. And you divorce it from the accountability of the church and you divorce it from the influence of the church. The second thing you do is you divorce the school of divinity from the broader university. And so now all of a sudden, 
you, you have this bifurcated view of education. And, and we think that, you know, uh, the academic pursuits, we think things like, you know, business and agriculture, or the sciences or whatever, it's over here. And the matter of theology and theological education it belongs over here, which facilitates that downward decline of the university over and against the school of divinity or the seminary. And because they're both divorced from the church, eventually the decline happens in both places. And that is almost universally true of early theological institutions. When you look, for example, at the Ivy Leagues, um, the universities are completely removed from and antagonistic toward the things of God. And the seminaries or schools of divinity are completely awash with pragmatism, postmodernism, and with heresy. Uh, so it's very important to us for the sake of the university and for the sake of the school of divinity that we maintain that relationship and that both maintain our relationship with the church. So ACU is a ministry of the Reformed Baptist Churches of Zambia. Uh, the School of Divinity is an integral part of the ministry of ACU. Chico, no, 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 no,
pambana ikumusa utaye koma bwenzi la tu yesu atikonda konda fe tipunzitse buye yesu tikondane Chico, chico, chico.